hitting it. And so that my All right. The ball Welcome, everybody. Team. Thank you for coming. Um, I am going to introduce Jenny King, who is a friend of the library, who um, all winter the friends have been putting on programs. And this is our last of the season. And um, Jenny is going to introduce the speaker. That <laughs> I don't know. She may or may not know. Does she yeah. know him? In nonpartisan way. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I think I know everyone in the room, so you, you know who I am. So I'm introducing my husband, John, who has been involved in this uh, Audubon project for two years now. And it's um, kept him very, very busy, which is great because he just retired. And, <laughs> and um, he's been working really hard with some help from Larry, who I see in the audience. Um, and he, the best part of this is he gets to use all the tractors at the golf course. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, he, it's like a little kid in a candy shop, I think. So he yeah. now has into heavy equipment. Um, so it's a great idea, it's a great thing he's doing um, to try to, you know, just make the golf course a more livable place for birds and people and whatever. So um, without any further ado, this is my husband, John King. Okay, so, uh, well, as Jenny said, I, I've been on the uh, golf committee for up to the entire team, I'm not quite sure how long, but uh, I got on it when John Bowen was the chair, and uh, for some reason I got kind of involved in this stuff and, and became very interested in it and kind of researched it out here and uh, found out about the Audubon International Golf Course Sanctuary Program. It's Audubon International, it's not Audubon USA, but it is a nonprofit that's located in uh, Troy, New York. And, and they do this stuff and other stuff too. But uh, they, they, the golf course uh, sanctuary program to me is a pretty interesting one. I'm not sure how many are certified, courses are certified in the U.S., but there are about five in Maine, is all. Um, but that's changing all the time. And that includes actually our neighbor, Castine, uh, Portland Country Club is one, uh, Mingo Springs uh, over in Rangeley is another. So anyway, it's a pretty nifty thing to do, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, one, of the reason, uh, one of the things I wanted to start with is uh, kind of an overview of why, I think anyway, our golf course is fairly important. And, and it's, it's, it's multifaceted. But one is the history. It's got a fascinating history. And Ken, you're going to laugh because um, I didn't know you. Were, oh. I didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> oh my. So, uh, Ken authored uh, a history of uh, the Tarotine course, and it's really kind of cool. I, the first nine-hole course is not the current course. It, it's uh, it's over where uh, near the Dillon uh, Cottage and Phyllis Collins house, and it was on Gilkey Harbor. Uh, but it was a nine-hole course, and uh, uh, it was laid out in 1896, which made it the fifth course to be laid out in the state of Maine, uh, following those other ones, uh, Kibo Valley, Northeast Harbor, Winter Harbor, and uh, PCC. So that, that's pretty cool. And uh, the other thing that's pretty cool, and this is not on that, but you can read that while I'm talking, um, it was in the 18... 90s that uh, the coast of Maine was kind of exploding uh, in terms of tourism and, and, and golf courses. Uh, all of a sudden people wanted to build golf courses all over the place. And a lot of people were coming up here. And uh, if, if you, anybody here has the history of the Mid-Coast Islands, I, I was looking at it this morning, it's really interesting. Butter Island used to be a resort back in the late 90s and the early aughts. Of nineteen uh, odds, <laughs> and uh, it actually had something called the golf grounds on it. I don't think it was a real course, but uh, it had a casino, and people would come up. and And uh, this is fascinating to me. 
uh, you take a steamer on a Friday night out of Boston, and you would arrive at Butter Island at 7 a.m. Huh. And, you, and, you, and, and with one stop in Rockland on the way up. And you would uh, spend the weekend cavorting around Butter Island, I guess, <laughs> maybe, maybe whacking a golf ball. Um, and then you would leave at 5 p.m. and get to Boston at 7 a.m. And the round trip ticket was five dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I guess it was deemed. It, the history is kind of sketchy here. Uh, Ken wrote a great uh, little history of uh, of the club. Some of this is stolen from him. Um, the, the actual building of the club took uh, took place over about three, two or three years. Uh, the, the Golflings Trust was, was created in 1913. Uh, it was going to be done initially for $10,750, but it went up to $15,000. Uh, it, it ran into some difficulties. Um, it was substantially completed by 1915 and supposedly put to use in 1916. Um, there are no drawings we can find. There's really no written history. I've always been waiting for it to appear in somebody's attic or in a trunk or something, but it hasn't shown up yet. So uh, anyway, the guy who designed it was Alex Finley, uh, and he was a Scot who had come to the United States. Um, he, he, in Scotland, he was purportedly the first guy to shoot a 72. And he did it with three clubs. And 72 is now kind of the standard par on a course. So uh, that was pretty important. Uh, and uh, so if, 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 I'll get the next page in a, to it. I'll get to the next page in a second. But if you read the history about him, supposedly he went to Ireland and introduced golf in Ireland as well, which is a <laughs> bit of a stretch, but nonetheless. Uh, and uh, he, so he comes to the United States and he wants to be a cowboy. And, and so he goes out to Nebraska and supposedly created the first golf course in the United States, in Nebraska of all places. So, uh, hey, whatever, you know. It, but, um, so John, he, did they keep the other course going until this one was finished? I think so. I think so. I think they would have, because it was, you know, things were popular then, and people expected to have their fun. So, um, so anyway, uh, he designed a few other courses in uh, Maine: McGunter Cook, uh, Winter Harbor, Belgrade Hotel, and Summit Springs, and ended up designing about 130 courses. And and uh, I, I gave you a link here, and Richard tells me that if you want to go read this stuff. Uh, He's recording this for you too, and the uh, URL links will be there. That is uh, the, on Lynx Magazine. This was a uh, uh, and, uh, kind of an interview with uh, uh, Alex's grand, great grandson, or grand, yeah, great grandson, or maybe his grandson. But anyway, so he, he's he's puffing a little bit. But one of the neat things is he also. Uh, worked for a, a sporting goods company that was, that was the predecessor of Spalding and um, made and sold golf clubs and supposedly so gave Francis Wimet, the famous winner of the 1913 U.S. Open, uh, uh, his first golf clubs in, in exchange for golf balls that Francis would be. Francis lived across the street from the country club down in Brookline. And he'd go to the country club and, you know, do what James Hamlin does, which is go and grab as many golf balls off the course as he can. And I think he got 50, I think it was 50 balls for a club. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, uh, to some he's known as the father of golf in the United States. And so, and he designed our course, which is amazing. <laughs> So anyway, uh, there's a link there if anyone wants to read more about it. Um, as far as the course is concerned, the total acreage is about 108 acres, uh, which is a lot more than the golf course, obviously. Uh, the golf course comprised is, is only 30 acres. And uh, that's the other reason I think 
the course is so important to us is not only the history of the course, but the fact that it's a huge green space on this island. And green spaces are getting few and far between if anyone has seen people getting off the first boat recently. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, that's pretty key. Now, unfortunately, the next page didn't come across, but it, it's on my computer. And let me just see yeah. if I can get on it. The reason I brought my computer is because I don't oh. trust its keyboard. Well, I won't hold you guys up that day. Anyway, this, we have a map of the course, which is what that is. And what's interesting about it is, as you pull into the golf course road, as you know, there's a small parking area for the Lily Gesson Trail. And that's all golf course, too. I, it's all golf, you know, we, we let everyone use it for walking purposes and the like. But that's a, a big hunk of land there that is not even used for the golf course at all. So uh, that's pretty important as well. So, uh, under current initiatives, I put the top one on because Arch wanted to talk about it. <laughs> We've got a wood, woods management thing going on, and then this Audubon International Golf Course Sanctuary Program. The woods management uh, program was actually started by John, John Bull. And um, uh, the first, uh, first part of that took place and, and involved um, work down around the second and third hole, uh, opening up the forest a little bit, improving to some extent the viewscape, but pretty much just trying to get rid of some of the deadfall and, you know, leaners and everything else that were sitting in there. Um, and uh, it was basically, basically the process is to get rid of the bad stuff, chip it up, and then wait for the understory to grow back up, which it will. Um, the second part of it is taking place right now. The, um, the right side of the fifth hole had a lot of deadfall and leaners and the like. And the scary thing from, from my perspective, but I called the sentinels, there were like five dead poplar trees saved by the fifth hole waiting to fall on. So, so, so those are gone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the only uh, other major part of that is going to be I don't know if you folks have been um, have, have noticed it, but the seventh hole, which is the par three with the green that's right by the main road, uh, the south side of that looks like a war zone. Uh, everything just tipped over and, and died, and, and um, that's going to get cleaned up. And when it does, it's probably going to make a big hole. Uh, I've already Donnie Shan and I have already talked about. Uh, we're going to do, be doing some planting either this fall or next year once we can get it in the budget. And we need to do some planting along the sixth hole as well because there's been a lot of cutting there, not done by the club, <laughs> but it, it's opened up a hole. And I expect that once the the work done on seven, which which I consider to be pretty necessary, um, is going to open up another hole. And we'll probably be planting like a hemlocks or something, something that is quick growing and uh, won't get eaten to smithereens by the deer. So um, anyway, those are the current initiatives. Um, as far as the sanctuary program is concerned, um, this, is the, this is basically the program. Uh, you do an initial, no, initial self-assessment and environmental planning form uh, that you send to them, and uh, they say, great, and go to work. And then there's, there's five different categories. There's wildlife and habitat management, 
chemical use reduction and safety, water conservation, water quality management, and outreach and education. And education. And so, uh, what you do with those, uh, you, you have to send these forms into them once you've done the requisite stuff. And they say, okay, great, congratulations, or Annie, you gotta do some more. Um, so far, uh, we sent two, two in, the wildlife and habitat management and the water conservation, and we've gotten certification on both of those. Um, I hope to do um, at least a couple more this year. Uh, the water quality is a tricky because they want stuff, they want you to test the water three or four times a year, and they're looking for stuff that all the water testing places in the state of Maine doesn't do, like dissolved um, oxygen, conductivity. You know, all the labs in, in the state of Maine are all set up to basically do drinking water testing because you know, half the population in the state of Maine has, has wells. So um, we're buying the equipment to do the testing ourselves. I, I, I attended a webinar and it doesn't say so in the written materials, but they said during the one webinar that you can do your own testing. And I'm like, well, why are we paying a and labs to give us results that don't mean anything to, the, to Audubon when we can do it ourselves? So we'll get to work on that pretty quickly. And then there's uh, outreach and education, and that's kind of like what we're doing today. Uh, I've been writing a lot of uh, articles for the Alpha Island News. Um, one, one of the things I wanted to mention is they, they want you to create a resource advisory group. And we did that. Uh, Linda is on it. I wanted Linda to be on it because she's on the pesticide committee and she can harass me all she wants about, about that. Um, and um, uh, Lauren Bruce is on it, as is Tom Tudor. Um, and, uh, which is a, a great resource because um, uh, one of the first things we did was we took a walk around the whole golf course to say, what do we have going here? Mm -hmm. um, and then once you've done those five things, they actually come and, come and visit us and do a site review. Uh, and then, if you get certified, you're certified for three years and then you have to recertify um, periodically just to make sure you haven't gone off the rails. So, uh, what we did was look around to see what we have and, and one, of the, one of the things I wanted to focus on today was the, the work that we did in connection with the invasives that were on the course because the course was saddled with invasives but the whole island is saddled with invasives and um, it's something that's endemic everywhere uh, and, and one of the ones that's really endemic everywhere is barberry. Uh, and <laughs> so we went around and tried to figure out where, where it all was. It wasn't too hard to figure out where it was, but <laughs> um, uh, this stuff, actually, and, and Larry Potter has been helping me a lot because th this is big stuff. That thing was probably six or seven feet high. And, and uh, uh, it's not easy to get rid of. Uh, <laughs> but. You know, and, and, and that's how big it gets. Uh, although, what's, what's interesting is counterintuitive, but the bigger it gets, the easier it is to pull. Because the little stuff is slippery. And we'll get a, you know, we'll get a, but the way you do it, it's great to have two people. Because <laughs> the way you do it is, uh, person number one, who's usually me, uh, crawls in there, <coughs> dressed head to toe, and puts either a double or a triple chain wrap on the stem, <coughs> which may require an approach from one side and then the other. And it doesn't hurt to put a clove hitch in there while you're, while you're doing it, because <coughs> as you pull it, it tightens everything up. Uh, we're lucky on the course because we have a Kubota tractor. Um, for what it's worth, uh, I did, I've done the same thing on my house, at my house, and I've done it with my 1945 Woolies Jeep. So if you have a truck and a chain, you can do this stuff. It doesn't hurt to have four-wheel drive, but it's also nice to have two people because then you don't have to jump in and out of the truck and readjust the chain and do all that junk, which is time-consuming and kind of a pain. But uh, so this is what we basically did: was we went around and, and grabbed that stuff. 
And you drove the tractor. No, I was on my hands and knees. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get it pretty much all out? We, well, you know we're going to get it all out. Uh, right. Most people say when you do these eradication projects, it's a minimum of three years. Mm -hmm. And the big stuff, if you pull it out and you get most of the roots, you're doing a good job. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. If it, the problem is the little stuff, because the little stuff is hard to pull out, it's very hard to dig out, and if you cut it, you're just propagating it. Right. So, and, and so, um, you know, it, it, so then you come up with, well, how do we get it out now? Uh, and we'll get, I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, we got this stuff out, so we got all the big stuff out, but you know, I, I've been around the course a fair amount this spring, and it's, it's popping out, uh, not where I pulled it out, or we pulled it out, but it, it is, it just comes, you know, and, and, and Part of the propagation uh, aspect is uh, birds. You know, they 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 eat the berries, and it can come up anywhere. And that's true for uh, uh, bittersweet as well. Uh, we have bittersweet on, on the course, but there's a ton of bittersweet on this island, particularly down on the south part of the island. And uh, that is this stuff. Wow. And that's a real invasive, obviously. <laughs> uh, this was taken down by the town beach. And the, the tricky thing about bittersweet is that, that this, this photograph was taken on September 20th. So it really jumps out at you in the fall because it turns yellow and it turns yellow early. And it's a great time to identify it. And, but uh, that will kill that tree. Event, you know, if, and, and it also, you know, the, the bittersweet you may be used to seeing is just a small little stem, but, but um, you know, the trunk can be like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be like a Tarzan thing. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down, it's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then the other one is honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. And that, that can get pretty big, too. Uh, if you cut that, it will come back, but it won't come back like barberry. You know, you know all of these are kind of individualistic, but uh, so that's pretty nasty as well. And, the, that's uh, right. and sometimes, you know, I sometimes it actually provides a barrier, so you have to live with it for a while until you can plant something and get a get a replacement for it. So anyway. Uh, the options for removal are try to pull it out of the ground. And to the extent you can pull it out and you can get um, most of the root structure out as well, you're probably pretty good. Um, the other is to cut the plant and treat it with herbicide and industrial vinegar. Um, I'm getting this from, or industrial vinegar, excuse me. I'm getting a lot of this also from uh, Approach Neck has done a very good field guide to invasives because they, they've got exactly the same ecosystem as do we. They've got a lot more money than we do, uh, but but they, they've got maps. They've got it, they've got it all figured out. It's, it's really impressive. And this is what they I got this from them. This is what they say the options are. And the third option is just just to gaily you know uh, spray the entire plant with herbicide. Um, to date, everything we have done uh, has been mechanical. We have not used any chemicals at all. Um, I'd like to say we never will, but I, you know, <laughs> we'll wait and see about that. Uh, one thing, uh, so uh, option number two here, cut the plant and treat it with, uh, let me deal with industrial vinegar first. Uh, you know, the normal vinegar that you buy at the grocery store is about 5%. Uh, you can get industrial vinegar at various places, and that's about 30%. Uh, it's, uh, it, its efficacy is a matter of debate. You can talk to some people that say you can put as much vinegar on that thing as you want, and it will come back again and again and again. And there are other people, Larry, you can speak to that a little bit, can't you? Well, I can. I mean, I, I've had some success, but you have to use a lot of it, and you have to stay on top of it. Yeah, 
Yeah, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and then the, it, the herb, the, it, the use of herbicides, I know it's very controversial, but if you just spray the trunk, and not spray, excuse me, paint the trunk, because what you do is you just paint the truck, trunk, and, and the way these herbicides are designed, and there, there are two kinds, tricloper and gly, glyphosate. That's Roundup, by the way. Um, uh, go to the roots, and, and they have a half-life, so, and, and they will kill the plant. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, but I was reading, the, just to put this in perspective, you know, we've got a single aquifer, I'm told, I'm not a, I'm not a water expert, but uh, the U.S.'s largest aquifer is the Ogallala aquifer, which goes from South Dakota to Texas and includes Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. And you know, what I left out was Nebraska as well. I mean, this thing's huge. This thing basically waters the entire western farmland. And, and apparently is being depleted at 250 billion gallons a year. And it's one aquifer. And I can tell you, as we, and right now, as we speak, probably hundreds if not thousands of acres of land are being treated with sprayed onto the ground roundup. So that uh, you know who can sell their soybean uh, seeds and their corn seeds. And so, um, you know, and, and we sit here and go, oh my God, I don't dare put, take a paintbrush and put some Roundup on this piece of bittersweet. Um, we haven't done it yet. I'm just saying that, you know, it, it all depends upon, you know, what the situation is. But anyway, those are your options and your considerations for removal. But so far, all we've done is number one. And, uh, and I think we're pretty good right now, actually, on the golf course. If I live down on, you know, down by the town beach on Pendleton Point, I don't know what I do, <laughs> to be honest with you. But, you know, it's a real issue, and, uh, so, and it's a balancing act, uh, and there's no easy answers there. Um, and then, once you get rid of it all, what do you add? And these are the considerations. Uh, number one is survivability. Because a lot of what you want to put in the ground is probably going to die. <laughs> and it's either going to die because uh, we're zone five and we're all over the place when winter comes. That's number one. And number two is a lot of this stuff gets eaten. But, and, and, you know, if you're doing this on the scope of a one acre home, you, you can protect this stuff, but if you're doing it when you're dealing with 108 acres, it's a little hard. So some of the stuff that we've planted is very deer resistant, but not native, but not invasive either, like Savari. Uh, but uh, that that is an issue. And so then you have native versus non-native versus invasive. Well, you don't want to plant invasives, obviously, but you know the downside is maybe planting. Um, uh, a non-native species that's a non-invasive species, but that will live. Uh, and then you want some species variety uh, because, and, and I mean that's classic, that's like the American elm disease, you know. I was listening to uh, NPR the other day, they were talking about a, a community in the Midwest somewhere where the developer who was being interviewed <laughs> Uh, had planted um, ash trees in the entire mm -hmm. community. And, and they're all gone now because of the emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. And so the community went from being a beautiful, you know, be beautiful, uh, beautiful tree community to having nothing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's why you want some variety. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you want uh, understory for uh, birds. And, and other wildlife. Uh, wildlife survivability is a wildlife issue. I, I put it in twice. Uh, growth rate and then the aesthetics as well. Um, so th that's what we've been dealing with. 
Um, and then here's some native options. Um, I put a uh, link up there into a really good uh, little publication about native options. It's down in the Chesapeake area, but it's, it's actually very good. Uh, red oak, red maple, swamp white oak, black willow, uh, hickory, blackberry, sycamore, all works for large trees. Um, if you get a chance, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, this guy, Doug Talony, but uh, spoke to uh, Mayim Audubon in 2016, and he is so good. It, it, it is very much worth uh, your while to, uh, to watch that video. Um, what's interesting to me is um, he's, he talks about the native species and vis-a-vis uh, -vis birds and uh, what's good. And, and, and uh, what's really good are oaks and willows. And the reason they're really good are they are host to multiple species of caterpillars. I think oaks can host like 130 species, I, I, I think. And that's what birds feed their young. And that's, that's how the young survive. So, um, you know, if, if you want to help ecosystems out, plant something that's going to help wildlife out, right? So, uh, anyway, if you get a chance, that is a wonderful uh, way to spend a little bit of time. Uh, so anyway, those are large trees. These are small trees, uh, native small trees. I don't see that many red clouds in the main here. How many, no. how, why is that? No, I don't. Is that, do they survive zone five? They do, but they need to be planted in the wind situation. They can't take a lot of wind. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Or exposure, you know, a sunny, like southwest side of a house, they do fine. Right. Southwest. Jenny, Jenny's, Jenny's my expert here because she worked, she worked with Skillens for 25 years. <laughs> but but right, what, it's funny because we drive home in the spring, and a lot, like uh, I think it's the isn't it the uh, state tree for Oklahoma? It starts in like Oklahoma and all the way across Arkansas. All you see in April are red buds. I mean, they're growing out of like. Um, crevices and rocks on the highway. I mean, that's yeah. how they're beautiful too. I mean, they're everywhere along the highway, and you get to Maine, and they're hard to grow for some reason. Yeah, yeah. but uh, dogwoods, dogwoods are lovely trees. But anyway, those are medium small trees, and you've got some shrubs. Um, bayberry thrives here. I never see pussy willow. Wild Rose, and this is interesting, uh, Rosa Rugosa is now, I think, effective this year. On the invasive list? I think it's oh, one. It's been, so it's, good. it's been being talked about for a long time. Well, I think it went on the invasive list as of this year, so you cannot buy it anywhere. Hmm. Not that you need to buy it because there's a million of them down the street, but... but um, you can come to our yard and dig up all the little birds that keep coming up in the lawn. So does that mean we're supposed to get rid of it? No, no it just means you can't buy it. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, you'll probably be encouraged to get rid of it, but no one's forcing you to get rid of it. What's, you know what else is interesting? You know what is a non... Well, hold on, this is 20. Uh, here, uh, here are perennials that are native. Um, we've planted some Joe Pye weed. It's pretty. It, it's a nice. It's a nice plant. We've done some on the golf course. I, it's coming back now, and it looks like it's getting eaten by something. But you know, <laughs> hey, whatever. <laughs> and to the extent you can uh, plant milkweed, I mean, I, I, that's been in the news a lot. Of the but you know what's not native, which is kind of interesting, is lupin. <laughs> and. There's talk of putting it on the invasive list. Oh, okay. it, it, every year at the nursery, we would see these proposed things coming up, and it would take a few years. Like burning bush, it took like five years to get mm -hmm. on the invasive list because the you know the wholesale nursery sort of fought against mm -hmm. it. And um, lupin is get ready. We might have to like go in March or something because they want to put. Lupin I don't. On. I don't think they'll get. I don't. Think <laughs> 
Everyone loves Lou. Well, I just love that. It's so pretty. You can tell it's invasive. Yeah. yeah. But it's so um, pretty. <laughs> So um, the other thing we're doing is we're keep oh and I here I'll pass this on. Um, we're trying to keep track of wildlife. And let me start with you. And I started keeping this list back in 2021, um, and it was kind of rudimentary. But it's, I'm, we're getting better at it. Wow. But is everything you've seen? Uh, well, it's everything I've recorded that I've seen. <laughs> it's not everything I've seen. But <laughs> the better stuff is in the back because it's newer. Right. Um, we've got a, uh, for what it's worth, anyone who's on the golf course and sees something, tarotinewildlife at gmail.com, hmm. you can report it. And it, I can put it on a form such as Ken is looking at. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention is uh, birds. Uh, it's Audubon International, obviously. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, if if you're not familiar with the app called Merlin, which which is done by Cornell, you got to get it. It's so cool. Um, it it's an app that easily goes on iPhones. I think it's a little bit harder with an Android phone, but I don't think it's impossible. But it's a bird identifier, and it does it by by song, mm -hmm. as well as by mm -hmm. pictures. So just to show you guys how it works, I went and stopped today. This is this morning at 9.16, and I stopped at the little parking lot at the head of the Lily Guest train. I turned it on for a minute and a half, and that's what, this is what I got. Song wow. sparrow, wow. common yellow throat, red eyed vireo, black throated green warbler, wood thrush, northern cardinal, red breasted wow. mud hatch, and black and white warbler in a minute That's and a half. It's amazing. So yeah. And what's really cool about this, uh, this app is that when you hear a song and you've got like all of these lit up and then one of them starts calling, it will highlight the one that's doing it. So, <laughs> so you can learn yourself yeah. the, bird, the bird song. Wow. And, and in the back of what's being passed around, I've been trying to go on a weekend, early on a weekend morning just to see what's there. And uh, it's really quite amazing. I mean, and, and it's really fun too. I mean, you, get to, you get to learn these bird songs you otherwise would not know. So, uh, and it's free. So, I mean, you're going to get a lot of emails or telephone calls, sorry about that, uh, from uh, Cornell asking for donations, but hey, that's okay. Uh, we'll give them your number. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Oh, wonderful. Can I take too long? No, I think we have time for questions. Oh, okay. I have, I have. Yes. Oh, you know, sorry. when we um, started the pesticide safety on Islesboro, I had to go to the, because we wanted it to be a town committee, I had to go to the select board and to make a presentation about what we wanted to do, which I did, and they were interested. And JT was a, a selectman then, and he said, start with the golf course. Oh. And he was so right because the golf course user at that time wasn't very safe in, in terms of, of pesticides. There were animals who were getting sick because oh, when wow. they when they drank water, you know, near the golf course, and it was really not good. So wow. I said thank you, and went and my first call was to John Bowen, who was head of the golf committee, wow. and he said I'm on it. And he got a hold of John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know the rest. It's just it's just so good for Osborne. And our little committee is so grateful to you. Really. Does that mean so like so before was the golf course being sprayed with pesticides and everything? Well, well I don't know about spraying, but they were I know things were being Scattered around. I would say around 2019 or 2018, uh, Donnie Shand, of his own volition and motivation, I think, uh, started a, an or 
organic approach to the golf course that was modeled on uh, uh, Riverside Golf Course. Riverside is Portland's municipal golf course. It's a 27-acre course. And uh, the uh, town administration in Portland, as well as in South Portland, was very concerned about pesticide use. So uh, Riverside did, did an organic thing, and I think that they're working towards certification on the same program that we are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but Donnie initiated that. Mm -hmm. And um, we do use pesticide on this course, but, but right uh, as things, you know, you can never, nothing's cast in stone because it all depends upon what, you know, disaster will occur next year. But uh, right now, the only pesticide we use is a <coughs> pesticide called acelaprin. Uh, it is designed to go after Japanese beetle grubs in, in the turf. Um, it's it's uh, classified by the EPA as a low-impact pesticide. Uh, you got to have some pesticide action if you're going to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Because if you don't use it, your, your, your turf gets completely eaten up where the grubs are, because the crows go after the grubs. Can you not use BT? We, uh, I, I don't think it's effect, I don't think it's as effective it as Japanese BT? beetle grubs, because mm -hmm. you're down in, in the turf. You're looking to, and uh, this stuff, if applied properly, uh, and and um, uh, kudos, by the way, to Donnie Pendleton, Keith, uh, Don, Donnie Shannon, Keith Pendleton, because uh, Keith Keith goes to all these classes and certification classes and stuff like that in terms of applying stuff properly and everything. Um, when this is is applied properly, supposedly, and I, I tend to believe this, but you never know. But uh, I tend to believe this. It does not affect birds. And it also does not affect pollinators, such as bees and things like that, which is which is huge. Um, and its use is very. I mean, the, the total yearly usage is approximately 150 ounces, which is one about 1.1 gallons. I, and, and that's for the whole course. So um, you know, it's diluted and everything. But I mean, in terms of what. what so, other than that, um, that's it. You know, no Roundup, no, none of that stuff. You know, uh, eventually, like I was saying before, in order to get rid of some of these invasives, we might have to use a herbicide. But if we do, it will be in a very minimal way. You know, if it's limited to the root system of what you're trying to get. That's okay, um, but you know the, the idea of like spraying a whole plant is, to my way of thinking, absurd. And then you got to burn, it. so not you know. <laughs> so, but anyway, so, go ahead, Arch. I have two things to say. How many days have we seen John and Larry? <laughs> you second my motion. Yeah. And, and this is great. Yeah. But if you had some videos of you and Larry, <laughs> six or seven feet inside some of these bushes, <laughs> scratches on the face, yeah. oh, I I'll mean, I, I, and would, would we feel guilty while we're doing we, playing we, golf? We always no, feel we guilty. Yeah. There might be some bad language. <laughs> oh no, no, they were, just, they were jolly the whole time, yeah. quite amazing. And the second question is, there has been talk, or, or the, Cherokee Club does own land on the other side of the inlet, and there's always been talk of a second nine holes that in, in either capacity, your golfing capacity or your environmental capacity. Do you have any knowledge about that? I don't. I, I don't think I'd be in favor of it because, I, number one, I don't think there's enough land for, golf. for, for nine holes yeah. um, to begin with. Um, and doing anything, I mean, keep in mind, you know, back in the days when all the cottages were built and the golf course was built, there was no EPA, yeah. there, there, there were no departments of this and that. Yeah. I mean, it, once you get within 75 feet of the water, you know, yeah. the hackles go up. And the other thing is, is uh, 
this is just me personally speaking. I, I don't pretend to speak for the club. But you go back to the very first thing that I was talking about with uh, the course having been designed by Alex Finley. Yeah. And it's just it's just this unique, wonderful thing. Yeah. It's also hard. Oh, I agree with you. I just, I just am curious about but, that line. I, I haven't heard any... Good. There, there's always talk about changing things. And, and you know, I, and I'm very much a traditionalist, so I'm, I'm, I kind of look askance at that a little bit. I know, I know. I, the older I get, the more meaner I get. <laughs> And it's yeah. No. So, but uh, kudos to uh, Larry for helping me. Yeah, boy. Oh. And and uh, and really, Donnie and Keith have been great. You know, because this is, you know, Keith. Keith's got some help. He had some help last year for a change, and the, the year before during the pandemic, he never got off that lawnmower. I know. And trying, you know, so trying to. You know, expand things to do all this stuff that I've been talking about just wasn't possible for them. Yeah. And so that's, which is one of the reasons I just started doing it myself. What's the name of the nice guy we played with Peter yesterday? Oh, um, Hans, Hans, Hans No, Hans the other one. Um, oh, uh, Jason. Oh, Jason. Ah, Jason. Yeah, he's, uh, he's now helping, isn't he? Yeah. Nice guy. And he knows a lot about golf. Jason Carr, C W R. I mean, one of the reasons. Oh, nice swing. Uh, but no, uh, I mean, one of the reasons the course is looking so good is some of the stuff that you brought with him. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions, comments, kudos? Kudos. 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 Kudos.